It's another live broadcast from True Fire Studios. He's back. We told you we'd get him back real quick. You asked for him back. He's back. Um, this time, uh, Scott Sherrard uh, put two in the can for everybody. You're going to love them. We're going to tell you all about it in a minute. <clears throat> for those of you that haven't yet been introduced to one of my actually favorite people, not just the fabulous guitar player, um, uh, for True Fire students, you know, Southern Roots was his first course. He's widely known as the lead guitarist and musical director for the Greg Allman Band. Not only an amazing guitar player, he's also a very talented songwriter, great singer, eight albums of his own, received a Grammy nomination for Best American Roots Song for My Only True Friend, which he co-wrote with Greg Allman. Let's see, uh, I'm not alone in thinking of him as one of the best guitarists. Billboard magazine, quote, one of the best guitarists in the country. In the Annapolis Star Tribune, Sherrard is the next Eric Clapton or Mike Bloomfield. Uh, and then from Craig Allman, I know all about guitar players. I've seen the very best, and Scott Sherrard is the perfect guitarist for my band. He understands that you don't need to play just for the sake of playing. Scott isn't one of those guys who thinks they get paid by the note. He never steps on the vocals, and he leaves plenty of room for everyone else to do their thing. And, but when it's time to solo, Scott delivers for it. That, that's from Greg Allman. Um, I love this quote. I just found this quote. Um, I don't know which genre I love him more for, blues, rock, soul, or pop. He sounds like an accomplished star in any of them. Scott Sherrard is one of those few who remind us there's only one genre, the music. That's from Midnight Special, Blues Radio. I'm going to talk to Scott about that in a minute. But uh, let's let him rest those weary fingers. We'll talk to him a little bit. <laughs> Welcome back, man. Welcome back. So this time, first time in, just a few months ago, you you did Southern Roots. <laughs> yep. One course. This time you came with two. I sure did. You guys <laughs> turned up the heat and uh I think uh I think we I think we got it done. I think we got two videos done in less than uh, 48 hours. Do you remember what we titled them? I'll let you introduce. Them. I don't. I don't even Do know. Well, I know one of them is thirty licks. Thirty southern roots licks. Oh, you of must course. know. Okay. And the other one is southern roots creative approaches. Neat. Okay. You didn't even remember those were your titles. It's no, a, I don't even think I saw A little bit of them. craziness here. I know. Um, <laughs> tell them what you think it's like <laughs> coming back in the studio and doing two in the same amount of time we did one last time. Well. You know, definitely, um, I've had a blast here working with Tommy and just like, uh, you know, we have a really good rapport and that helps a lot is just everybody here is just really great at what they do and really cares uh, about the music. Everyone puts the music first here mm -hmm. and it's a t music's team game, man. It you is. know, so that's that's really what it's all about. I mean, yeah. if if you guys didn't have it so dialed in i mean it's it's just like being a musician and going to play with a band or back up a singer songwriter or mm -hmm. even play you know yourself it's like the better the team and the more prepared everyone is the more you can get done and the mm -hmm. better it is and this is about as good as it gets for yeah. this you, type of education you know, you know you made an interesting comment which I, I i think um you know connects to that what you just said anyway is um the first go round we used some of our tracks here which were done by very masterful musicians. You know, they were live tracks. But you got to work with your team, with your band, right? It made all the difference in the world for you, right? Yeah, and, and my guys were, were based out of New York City, um, which is where I've lived for like 23 years and counting now, even though I'm originally from Michigan. Um, you know, the, there were... Their key elements in my creative output has been, you know, obviously creating the songs, creating the album, and then, you know, building a band around it. Mm -hmm. And recently, in the last couple of years, I've had this band that I just love that I've been on the road with uh, supporting my last record, Saving Grace. Tell everyone the name of the band. 
and uh, well, it's just Scott Sherrard band as of mm -hmm. now. But uh, Brett Bass is the bass player. Mm -hmm. He also played in the Greg Allman band at the end. Yeah, uh, he was our last bassist, and uh, is an old friend of mine and just a wonderful musician. And then Eric Kalb is the drummer, who some of your your uh, watchers here might know him from uh, Deep Banana Blackout. He played with John Schofield, mm -hmm. Eric Krasno. So um, he's no stranger to great guitarists, mm -hmm. uh, which is good for me because it gives me something to aspire to. Um, but the three of us have been touring mostly as a trio. Occasionally we add a fourth mm -hmm. piece, Craig Dreyer. Yeah. On, he plays organ and sax. Yeah. Um, but for this recording, I stripped it down to the power trio just to kind of pay tribute to the hundreds of gigs we've played over the mm -hmm. last couple of years. And we're covering the material that uh, we were playing on the road largely on this new collection. And then I should also say my friend Graham Hawthorne has a wonderful studio in Harlem in New York City called uh, Studio 127 mm -hmm. on 127th Street. And my partner in crime, Charlie Martinez, who's been my engineer and co-producer for 20 years on every recording project I've done mm -hmm. of original music of my own, yeah. um, recorded these tracks at that studio and rough mixed them off for us. Yeah, the tracks are incredible. And playing with your team, your people, your band, your all of that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah, and especially, you know, the emphasis this time was on mostly on songs that I've either written or co-written mm -hmm. on albums past and albums future. Mm -hmm. So um, the record I'm making now, my sixth solo album, uh, features this band playing live on the floor, and then we're adding textures and layers to it as we go. But mm -hmm. it was basically taking the core of where I'm at creatively and trying to break it down with analysis about not only how I play and improvise, but also how I arrange and somewhat also how I compose or how I approach the thing as a whole, you know? Awesome. So let's, we, we're going to try to give folks a little sneak peek and listen to uh, both of these new projects that we shot this week. Let's start with um, 30 Southern Roots Licks. And before you demo the first one, um, you know that quote uh, by, what was it, Midnight Radio, right? Or talking about how, you know, rock, soul, blues, funk, it's kind of like all become kind of one genre now, hasn't it, right? So how, but describe to us what you mean by Southern Roots. Well, I mean, the, the concept is really like American Roots music. But right. the thing is, is that all of the greatest music in America comes from the South. That's where it was all born. Now, mm -hmm. it moved to Chicago, it moved north, it moved west, and we have all the beautiful and amazing music scenes that came out of it. Mm -hmm. But it all comes out of basically New Orleans, you know, and, and the Delta, specifically the Mississippi Delta. Mm -hmm. And it's a combination. Also, you know, the, the mountains of Appalachia. So you've mm -hmm. got a mix of like, right. you know, traveling musicians, country preachers, gospel music, mm -hmm. field hollers, slave songs, mm -hmm. all this stuff. That's where it was born. It was all born in the South, mm -hmm. you know? So let's give them a taste. Let's do um, pick, how about uh, uh, B7 Vampin'. Remember that one? Yeah, we were just doing, we were actually just playing over this for the intro. So this is one of the 30 licks. So for this particular lick, I decided to focus on, the key of B is so cool for the guitar. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think there's enough songs in B. Um, another one is C sharp or F sharp. All three of those are really cool because mm -hmm. you get you can use open strings a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'll play the lick that uh, I did in 30 licks. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the first one of 30. Um, and it's basically just playing off a B seventh or ninth chord mm -hmm. with open strings ringing through a melodic line. Cool. Tommy, roll something.
do uh, do me a favor, because you said something that you don't hear very often. Um, you know, usually people say, oh, for guitar, it's, you know, it's E, key of E, key of D, key of A. But you said F sharp and C sharp. Yeah, I mean, really what I love is you've got so many of those. I mean, Hendrix is one who immediately comes to mind. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you have like, uh, what is that one like? You know. You know, the way you can use the E against the C sharp. Okay. And then F sharp is, you know, famously like... Then you have, it's been a while since I played that one, but you have the open A, yeah. E, F sharp. So it's like. I just love that. So it's the ability to use the open strings in your lines or, or vamps. Right? Yeah. And then, I mean, again, in C sharp, if it's C sharp minor, you know, you can play that, or you can also play like a minor 11. Nice. Yeah. You know, those kind of things. And then in F sharp, you can do these. I love that stuff, man. Very nice. I love that too. It's like man. sus chords, you Absolutely. know? Absolutely. So um, I'm going to try to get us through both of these courses. Um, get ready to do the minor six West thing. I love okay. that one. And uh, just some quick housekeeping. If you haven't told us where you're tuned in from, please do so now. And Scott will shout out to you. We always, always love and appreciate um, everybody tuning in from all these different time zones all around the world. So please let us know where you're tuned in from and we'll shout back to you. Um, also, you'll notice underneath the video, some important things. One is, Scott's got two courses we're going to be showing off today, and there's a promo code. As usual, you've got, I think it's 48 hours to use Scott Live. You can click the link, pre-order one, pre-order both, use it on his existing Southern Roots course, and save 25%. That's a pretty big savings. Um, and then there's a trivia question where somebody, some lucky viewer, is going to win a $100 True Fire gift card. And you can buy all of Scott's stuff. Um, and that trivia question today is, get ready. You're going to have to pay attention. Um, Scott just joined, literally, I just heard it today, uh, a very well-known band who has seen the Bright Lights o Memphis and the Commodore Hotel. They've seen the Bright Lights of Memphis and the Commodore Hotel. Name that band. Do not answer it here in the chat. Don't give the answer away. It'll lower your odds of winning. Right, Scott? Be crazy. Um, click on the link. It's underneath the video. Answer it there. We'll pick a winner uh, towards the end and uh, give you the $100 gift card. And then, while you're over, underneath the video... Click that thumbs up if you're digging what you're hearing and uh, and seeing. All right, man. Let's do minor six Wes. Why don't you play the riff first and then teach us a little something off of it? All right. Well, this is something I nicked off a Wes Montgomery record called Live at the Half Note. It's a pretty famous record of his. I know I've I've read before, like Pat Metheny's called it like his favorite guitar album of all time. Oh, really? And stuff. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's basically this. You know, with Wes Montgomery, I mean, you're dealing with someone who's, I mean, it's either him or Django Reinhardt in terms of, like, virtuosity. Mm -hmm. You don't get any more virtuosity. <laughs> you sure don't. Because he can solo with single note lines, octaves, and chords, yeah. and he builds his solos, especially on this Live at the Half Note record, in these, like, the succession. He has a compositional approach to playing where it's single note lines, octaves, chords. Mm -hmm. That's kind of his formula. Yeah. And it's the stuff he does with it is insane. His feel is as good as it gets, but he can play tons of notes. Of course, he famously only played with his thumb, mm -hmm. which when I was a kid, I got to play with Mel Ryan a bunch, who was the organist on the first few West Montgomery records and was his childhood mm -hmm. friend. So I got to pick up some really interesting tidbits from him 
Um, Wes didn't read music. He only played by ear. So he's like any other rock musician that we love <laughs> right. in that respect. That's right. Um, so that should give you some more license to feel like you can hack away at this stuff <laughs> the way I've tried to. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I learned this when I was in high school off uh, Live at the Half Note. Honestly, it was one of only a few of the licks that I could actually figure out. Uh-huh. Um, I'm still working on that solo. It's about five minutes long. So uh, uh-huh. that was back in the day before tab was as prevalent as I had it was. this on <laughs> CD. Okay, there you yeah, go. Yeah, and there was no tab for uh-huh. for anything except yeah. for eruption. Back in my day, it was <laughs> vinyl records that you had to drag sure. your thumb to, just to slow, slow it, it down. down to change the key. Tear, was another one. Pitch, yeah. warbly, all that. Yeah. Stuff. Um, and I used to walk a mile in the snow to get to school. And of course, all that good, of course. All right, let's roll the track and listen to. A minor six west. Oh, that's the wrong track. It's live here from True Far Studios. Doesn't happen often, but every now and then. I think this one was in six eight, but I can do the same lick over this feel if you want to roll that one, Tommy. Oh, the wrong track. Okay, let's roll it again. what you were doing there what's the key kind of harmonic nature of that lick well i mean it's a minor six licks what we're doing is we're doing the same essentially the same riff in two octaves and it ends on the six both times Mm -hmm. so you're sliding into the fifth got the ninth and then you're landing on the six and then we do the same thing up an octave and now here we change the rhythm. We go to the six, the four, and end on the nine. Cool. So it's it's kind of it's very reminiscent of like the late fifties Miles type mm-hmm. harmony, which we also cover on other parts of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean the way Wes does it is with his thumb. So you can see that's got a more elegant oh, yeah. sound. Yeah. And he plays this lick on a bunch of records. He uh-huh. also plays it on a version of Freddie the Freeloader off yeah. one of those organ trio records. Yeah. But I play it with the pick, and uh, I've gotten a lot of mileage out of it. And it's all just another way to circumvent playing an A minor. Yeah, it's killer, man. It's, uh, and one of these 30 Southern Roots licks. Let's play them another one. How about uh, D standard slide? Okay. So... I got the core seed and bottle here. Standard meaning we're in standard tuning, Mm -hmm. of course. And I'm going to do something where I fret behind the slide. And this is off of the Statesboro track, right? Yep. standard slide work don't you mostly yeah yeah and Um, why just because it's easier not to (laughs) grab another guitar because i moved to the east village in 1996 to do a five floor (laughs) walk-up there you go (laughs) i showed up in new york with five guitars Uh and a super reverb and a pro reverb okay and it took me one weekend of doing gigs (laughs) to get a blues junior Uh and just take my 335 Uh uh-huh that's the best answer I've ever heard, and a real one, too, right? Yeah, I just gave in. I was just like, screw it. Because I had guitars in open G, open uh-huh. A, open E, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But honestly, playing slide and standard, I mean, 
really, there are a couple sort of masters of it. Warren mm -hmm. Haynes, obviously, is the best known and by far one of the greatest ever to do mm -hmm. it. Um, check out his solo on uh, Blue Sky from that live record they did um, in the early 90s. It's absolutely insane in terms of what he can do in standard and mm -hmm. really mimic all these different open tunings. And then the other guy is Jack Pearson, who's, you know, oh, guy incredible. who I talk about oh, every yeah. time I do a video. I know. I know. It's hard not to talk well, about I just him. played with him in Nashville yeah. uh, a couple times in the last couple months on some shows. And it's like every time I play with him, I learn something new. Yeah, I mean, you know, you know he's a guy that, um, you know, all, all everybody talks about Jack Pearson in the business, you know. But a lot of the public, you know, the listeners don't aren't really tuned into him yet. You know, um, well, he's kind of quiet and subterranean with his career in a bit. He's also an unbelievable mandolin player. You ever hear him play? Mandolin? Yeah, he can do it all. Or man. acoustic guitar. He can play anything. gypsy jazz. He yeah, can play. He's crazy. You know anything? Yeah. Bluegrass. Jack I heard him do it all. Pearson. Jack Pearson. Go check him out. Um, okay, let's do another one. Miles Ninth. Okay. Tell us a little bit, you know, uh, tie it into the Miles Ninth thing. All right. So, you know, when Miles started really using this, this uh, modal approach, okay, probably started around, you know, the end of his collaboration with Gil Evans, like Sketches of Spain is when you first started to hear this kind of, this sound coming out of him where, mm -hmm. you know, when he was in his youth, he was kind of imitating Dizzy Gillespie mm -hmm. when he was playing on those early Charlie Parker records. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to play a lot of notes. And I think that went a little bit through his next period, the cool jazz period. But that transition where he was doing, doing those orchestrated, uh, very well-funded sessions by Columbia uh, with Gil Evans and then going into Kind of Blue and the small sort of quintet version of that mm -hmm. same sound. Yep. He started to lean more heavily on these minimal mode playings and started to really focus on these key sort of target notes mm -hmm. and sort of leaving you hanging. And it's this kind of rope a dope he has, which I think is an appropriate word to use for him because he was also a boxer, mm -hmm. is he really plays like a boxer. He kind of takes a jab and then he stands back. And then he kind of sneaks up on you. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, he's got you again. Uh -huh. And that's kind of the idea with this line. And, and you know, playing through it is I was try I'm really oversimplifying the way you would play it mm -hmm. just for emphasis on what the harmony is against mm -hmm. the chord. Because you got a A minor 7. And I'm starting on the 5th and then going up the sort of like minor scale here with a 6. And, of course, the key thing is this. You know, if you've listened to any Miles, mm -hmm. that should be recognizable Absolutely. immediately. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then I also talk about playing with dynamics all the time, not just space, but also dynamics where you can really emphasize one phrase and then sort of change the dynamic of the follow-up. So stuff like... That's very miles mm -hmm. to do something like that, you know. Nice, man. And it's all about using your pick, at, you know, to kind of change your attack and 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 let the guitar breathe a little more, as mm -hmm. opposed to just bearing down on it all the time. See, I mean, even with this, you know, the few licks we played, we borrowed from Wes, we borrowed from Miles. There's like, you know, this kind of merging of influences. And still in a very kind of contemporary vibe, you know? Well, it's rock and roll. It's rock and roll. <laughs> that's what it is. That's a, you that's know, when a... I play it on this guitar, it's yeah. rock and roll. <laughs> because it's all of those things at once all yeah. the time. You know, the great rock and roll bands and the artists I've had the honor of knowing and working with, um, you know, they all 
listen to music the same way I do, which mm -hmm. is they hear it as good music or bad music. Yeah. They don't hear it as jazz, right. punk rock, folk, bluegrass. That's a great way of putting it, man. Well, that was Duke Ellington. That's yeah. a Duke Ellington quote. That's there's only two kinds quote. of good music. There's <laughs> only two kinds of music, good yeah. and bad. <laughs> Well, what's awesome is, I, I think certainly for we students of guitar is, you know, if you're playing blues or you're playing rock and roll, you know, you're demonstrating to us that it's okay to listen to other genres of music and bring those influences or those harmonies or even the rhythmic approaches into whatever style you're playing, you know? Um, do one more, man. Let's do that Nashville banjo thing. And oh, God, this one's our... hard. <laughs> Hope let's, I'm warmed up for let's this. Let's round out our rock and roll here. in a while <laughs> well uh guess who chimed in jason lachlan talk about <laughs> he <laughs> can play York. that one better His than timing me <laughs> is perfect yes he can uh jason of course we we've been working with jason what i i don't know how many years we probably have 20 projects under our belt uh he's a fellow new yorker do you guys get out i mean jason's the guy who brought me here essentially okay, there you go i know you guys were mm -hmm. trying to track me down but i yeah. had some people throwing up smoke i, I know jason and finally jason happen, broke through man. I know. He made it happen. He just did. Did you hear Thank his you, uh, latest project, Sound on Sound? Have I you haven't heard, heard it yet. No. Oh, my God. He it's, um, you know, it's kind of focused on uh, kind of less Paul inspired, but he built a track up, up playing all the parts on guitar. You know, hey, Tommy, how many different uh, tracks on Sound and Sound? Okay, so I'm wow. going to go read the description. I don't want to misquote it here, but um, he did things like Les would do, you know, where he would play it slow and then speed it up, you know, but uh, very masterful guitar player. And Jason, thank you for bringing Scott into our world here. Uh, he's, uh, he's making a big contribution. Um, time for you to shout out to your fans in Michigan, Southern California, Virginia, Oldsmar, Harlem, that's in the Netherlands, uh, New Jersey, <laughs> Las Vegas, Harlem. the original Harlem, Melbourne, Australia, Eugene, Oregon, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, London, Belgium, Santander, Spain, wow. uh, Delft, uh, NL, Netherlands, uh, Scotland, South Texas, British Columbia, north of Norway, I guess is Northway. the actual, it's the north way, uh, San Diego, Rome, and Brazil. Isn't that crazy? All yeah, by people. the way, for Netherlands, I'm going to be there next week at Where? the Flirting with the Blues Festival. Flirting? Flirt. Flirting, flirting with the Blues. Well, as in Fordine, F-O-R-D-I-N-G, or Fourteen. That would make more sense contextually, but it's flirting. Flirting? Flirting with the Blues. Okay. <laughs> I don't name them, I just play them. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it's a, a couple-day festival where I'm going to yeah. be teaching and playing, and yeah. uh, Matt Schofield is yeah. there, Kid yeah. Ramos. Oh, man. Uh, it's going to be killer, man. Nice. We're all going to be jamming together. Um, I got a gig with Matt Schofield, too. And, and at, Netherlands, uh, you know what? Region, you know, town? I, I'd have to look it up. It's 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 not in Amsterdam. I know that. OK, but well, we've got a, a couple town. of north. Uh, we've got a couple of folks from there. Look it up. Google it. And Forwarding with the Blues Festival. Yeah. OK, they'll tell us where it's at. All right, man. You want to do. Is it Maceo or Maceo? Maceo. Let's do that one. James Brown's Horn Man. <laughs> nice. Ready, yep. Okay, what style haven't we infused into our rock and roll? Um, do you've got one more? Do the funky Wes. Okay, 
Uh, oh yeah, over the same track, right. Okay, so this is another West Montgomery lick that uses the sixth and, uh, and an octave. This is the one I thought we were gonna play earlier. I confused the two of them. <laughs> so this is what I described earlier that okay. I'm gonna do now. Okay, cool. By West Montgomery. Okay, cool. Oh, so you're saying it now wasn't Tommy. Now I see what happened. I got, I got the two Wes's mixed up. Do you know Tommy could have thrown you under the bus there, but he did not, did he? He took it like a trooper, right? I mean, you know, we all have our role to play. There you go, man. I'm well, you can get it. away with anything. You're the artist, okay? <laughs> all right, Tommy, roll that one. Everybody. So that's like one, two, three. We did about six or seven of the 30 licks from Southern Roots Licks. Um, and, and we covered enough range, I think, to really, um, you know, illustrate to folks how kind of universal a vocabulary this is. And at lunch, we were talking about, you know, a licks player that they're really phrases. Talk to that a little bit. Because this is not about learning these licks exactly like you're right. What is it about, really? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, as an improviser, I mean, uh, what's another good quote to use here? Uh, what, I don't know if this one was Picasso or Stravinsky. I forget, but it's the, uh, what is it? Good artists copy, great artists steal. Yeah. You know that one? <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, being a great improviser, I mean, you're some of your own parts, which is phrases. And I always, you know, I work with students a lot. Like, I do a lot of lecturing. I teach privately on Skype. Um, you know, whenever I have less and less time this last year, but you know, when I have time, I love to teach. And this is the most common theme that I run into with improvisation is you're only as good as the last phrase you learned mm -hmm. by one of your influences. Mm -hmm. And the more influences you have on different instruments in different styles, mm -hmm. um, the more tools you have in your kit when the time comes on stage to improvise, and whether the challenge is to play a four bar solo that's memorable mm -hmm. or a four minute solo that's memorable, mm -hmm. there's a different tool in the kit for all those approaches. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to play a gig like the gig I played with Greg Allman for almost a decade, we would, there was, again, he's one of the architects of rock and roll and he would listen to every genre of music all the time. And the show was a reflection of that. Mm -hmm. Waltzes, instrumentals that were 15 minutes long, mm -hmm. uh, three minute folk songs, <laughs> five minute soul ballads. Uh -huh. You know, it was all there. Yeah. And you had to be, you had to be able to go from, you know, uh, Cornell Dupree or Steve Cropper type accompaniment to more of like an Americana kind mm -hmm. of approach, acoustic approach to, you know, uh, playing a jazz, uh, basically an improvised modal jazz solo mm -hmm. for a few minutes that would keep people interested. Mm -hmm. So that's also how my high school band played. So when I played with Greg, it was like exactly the same stylistically, mm -hmm. Yeah. obviously at a level that's, you know, uh -huh. the highest it can be in right. terms of his contribution. Uh -huh. But um, it's an ethos, man. It's rock. Yeah. That's what rock and roll is. You're yeah. like a curator. Yeah. You know? That's you get to pick and choose what you want. That's a great way of, of putting it. And you were also talking about how um, any one of these lines or phrases can be kind of, uh, you know, twisted and turned rhythmically, uh, played over different genres or different styles. They're not, they're not necessarily connected to the style of the track that you're presenting it with. Yeah. You know, well, it's um, like James Brown. Is he a funk artist? No, he's just an artist. <laughs> right. Like, who's what does Prince play? Right, exactly. Everything. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Led Zeppelin. Everything. Right. Well, Almond Brothers Band. Everything. Everything. They touch on everything. Yeah. You know, and but the songs are the commonality between all those people. Very good point, man. Yeah. Let's tell them about um, this new edition of Southern Roots Creative Approaches. This one. We, we love this concept. Tell them what you've done here. Well, I mean, you know, basically, we're building on the last series. The last series was sort of a, a catch-all. I mean, I literally started it with the first thing I ever learned to play on the guitar, mm -hmm. right? 
and then went through, kind of touched on all these different angles for learning to develop your playing as a rhythm player and a weed player. But this time around, with my own band involved, creating uh, original tracks of my own, using largely my own original compositions mm -hmm. for these, it was to put an emphasis on not just the improvising, but also the arranging and the writing that I've done for the Greg Allman band for that decade, and mm -hmm. then also that I've done for my own band for 20 years, mm -hmm. and trying to talk about how creating the bigger picture informs your ability to compose a solo mm -hmm. that goes over it that actually complements the band, the vocal, the lyrics, mm -hmm. the arrangement, the groove. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a, you know, this is a more comprehensive approach to creativity um, uh, with the same, you know, the same style music, the Southern Roots music, mm -hmm. which is all these genres that we keep listing off, blues, jazz, rock, mm -hmm. bluegrass, gospel, soul. Nice. You know. So it, in, um, instead of performing and then explaining or demonstrating, how about for these, tell us, you know, give us the creative application of the creative approach and the story behind uh, what you're doing, say, for Saving Grace, okay? Title, cut off Saving Grace. Yep, right? off my last solo, um, my fifth solo record. Which, uh, man, you, you, you got some really rave reviews on that album so you know yeah i kudos. think that one that one kudos we, to you and the band man. thanks great material we Just, got it to number six on the billboard blues charts and we did you know ov well over 100 shows all over the world yeah, last year it's, to support it's, it. it's it's a significant album it's a great piece of work thanks man so tell us a story about saving grace and then play it and are you going to do the rhythm and lead demonstrations tommy i think that's the idea if he's up for it yeah yeah, your, your we'll, do the, we'll do the rhythm first and then do the lead. Okay, perfect. Um, so quick background on this. So my record, Saving Grace, half of it was cut in Memphis with the high rhythm section who played on all the Al Green records. The other half was cut in Muscle Shoals, Alabama at Fame Studios, which is also where I cut Greg Allman's last record, Southern Blood, really? which we touch on this as well here. Uh -huh. But this track, Saving Grace, features Chad Gamble on drums, who's one of my all-time favorites. He's Jason Isbell's drummer. He's been with him since the beginning. Um, Dave, the legendary David Hood on bass, who's the bass player on I'll Take You There by the Staples Singers and a lot of Aretha Franklin stuff. Yeah, unbelievable. And then uh, my buddy Eric Finland is playing organ yeah. and, um, and guitar. So that's mm -hmm. basically, it's like a four-piece rock band track, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a song I wrote that just touches on a lot of my influences. You know, it's got kind of everything from Otis Redding to Pink Floyd kind of mm -hmm. mixed into the soup on it. Um, but the cool thing about the original recording of this on my album is that I'm actually, I got Dwayne Allman's 57 Gold Top Les Paul that he played on the first two Allman Brothers records and on part of Layla. Mm -hmm lent to me for a few hours one day at fame oh, man. and this was the first time that guitar had been played in that studio since he yeah. was alive is what wow. i was told the day of the session so um really yeah because he used to use that guitar in that studio to cut so Jeez. that guitar is on this track okay. it's on this track and three other ones so okay. it was pulling a lot of mojo out of me yeah um it's also the only guitar solo of my own that i've actually forced myself to learn really and i've it's one of the hardest things I've had to learn, and I don't mean that because it's necessarily good. I just mean it because it's so frustrating to be <laughs> the person who made it up, and you can't get your hands physically around it. <laughs> but um, I was on the road promoting this record, and I tried for the first couple gigs to 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 make something else up, yeah. and nothing fit over uh -huh. it. And and I remember at one point having a conversation with Brett Bass, my bass player, about it, and and. You know, he was saying he kind of agreed with me, and I was like, "Screw it, I'm learning the soul off the record." Yeah, and go. then I played it, and everyone was like, "Yeah, that's that's how you have to do that." Okay, cool. So I guess there's some something solos to it, are like that. Though, sometimes you get you know? lucky. I guess it's yeah, the first one I've ever so. played where I felt like yeah. I couldn't come up with anything else. Yeah. Whether it's better or worse, I have no hey, idea. Some of the most memorable rock and roll tunes of in history are all about the solo <laughs> more than it anything can be. Else, it can be. Right? Yeah. Okay, you're going to do the rhythm part first? Yeah, so the rhythm part is a real basic first position arpeggiated thing. It just okay. goes up the scale. So the song's in the key of G. Okay. And it's got, you know, one of these kind of like sort of gospel soul rock mm -hmm. feels. And then when it gets to the bridge, we kind of open it way up for the solo, of course. And it switches to the relative minor. So we go to the key of E minor. Yeah. And it just goes through the scale like this. E minor 7, 
D slash F sharp, G6, and you have B minor. I guess that's a sus4. Yeah. And then we go to A7. And on the A7, I do all these kind of sus2, sus4. And it's in, uh, it's in like 12-8 time. Cool. Let's yeah. roll the track, Tommy. play the seminal solo. All right, let's do it. Okay. I've been having a lot of trouble. I, I broke a lot of high E strings yesterday. I think going from 20 degrees in New York to oh, 80 absolutely, degrees here. Absolutely. That happens so much. You go from there to this hot, balmy weather. You yeah. know, like overnight. My guitar has been you get crying. off the plane and it's, you know, wreaks havoc. Um, okay, I'm trying to get through as much of the music as possible. Let's do a good man. All right. This is also from Saving Grace. Um, a story I tell in the in the course, just to share some background, is um, this was the first song Greg Allman and I wrote together. Uh, it was slated for Southern Blood. We never got to it. We never finished the arrangement. Mm -hmm. But the demo of Greg and I, with Greg singing it, um, found its it found its way into the hands of Taj Mahal mm -hmm. through my friend Chank Middleton, who was mm -hmm. Greg's best friend for his essentially his whole life. Um, Taj loved the tune, wanted to cut it. Uh, had no intention at the time of making a record, so uh, offered to sing it on my own record. Really? Um, so the record was done. It was 10 tracks, yeah. half in Muscle Shoals, half in Memphis, and then uh -huh. we put together a session in New York City. And at the same time, I had recently befriended the uh, legendary Bernard Purdy, mm. who happened to be in town the same day as Taj. And I thought, ooh, what <laughs> if I do this song with yeah. Taj and Bernard together? Yeah. And that's what's on the record. That's so Incredible. And... Um, so the record has, you know, the horns we had cut in Memphis later. Yeah. Uh, it's got two keyboards. It's got rhythm guitar, slide mm -hmm. guitar. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a loaded boat. So mm -hmm. we've been touring it as a trio. Mm -hmm. So on this video, I demonstrate how I shrunk this arrangement from like a nine-piece band, essentially, mm -hmm. to a trio mm -hmm. where I'm kind of like doubling the bass line and chording at the same time in the first position. Yeah. The bass line's a big part of the composition. It's basically just a funky blues, kind of mm -hmm. in the tradition of like Johnny Guitar Watson, mm -hmm. who's, you know, Greg and I was like one of, both of us was one of our biggest influences. Um, so the idea was to be able to fill up the space with the guitar, but also double the bass line. That's such a big part of the hook. Cool. Um, so are you going to demonstrate two separate parts or like yeah. you would do it in a power trio setting? How yeah, do I'll, do? I'll do the rhythm part first, which I'll play basically what I play as an intro and also okay. what I play underneath the vocal that okay, I sing. Cool. And then after that, I'll play some slide for you in standard tuning mm -hmm. that's reminiscent of what I did on the record. And that's also what I do live. Okay, it's, cool. You know, it's all in standard tuning. Let's do it. A good one. <laughs>
how we play it, you know, and, and recently what we started doing is I was doing that. And then one day at a gig a couple months ago, I just turned around to, to Eric Kalb and I was basically like, play, play it double time, uh -huh. you know, and now we play it like. That's where we've ended up with it. Who did the vocals on the album? On the well, recording? Taj Mahal sang that it's song. It's so Taj Mahal. I, no wonder he wanted to do that. Right? Yeah, well, now that I'm... Actually, it was kind of like that way of playing that guitar part <laughs> yeah. came to me after he did it. Uh-huh. You know, so that's pro it was probably somewhat inspired by yeah, it's his such, sound. It's you know? like such a great group. Play the slide part. Okay. Now. So, you know, basically I'm doing something just sort of in the style of how I play it on yeah. the record. On yeah. the record, I've got my old... 1964 Harmony Bobcat uh -huh. with big old strings and uh -huh. the action raised up right, way high, <laughs> but I still play it in standard tuning. Uh -huh. And that thing just screams. It's got those gold foil pickups yeah, on it. Nice. You know, you just put that in a yeah. like my Vibrolux and turn it on seven, and it's nice. just heaven. I bet. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do what I do live with it now okay. with this with this guitar, my 336. Cool. Such a great tune. The album is is phenomenal. Um, Thanks, so, buddy. you know, you have to bring your band down to Florida so we can come hear you live. Man. Well, I mean, I you You're know going to Jamaica. I know that. But well, there's that. But okay. I, if you want me to boost a little bit, December twenty yes. seventh, I'll be at the Blue Jay Listening Room in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh, solo acoustic. Nice. And then on the 29th, 30th, and the thirty first of December, yeah. including New Year's Eve, I'll be yeah. at the Funky Biscuit in Boca Raton for three nights. Now that's a good possibility. Do yeah. you mean solo or with a van? Now that is a special show. It yeah. used to be Butch Trucks's of the Allman Brothers that's right. uh, New Year's Eve family show. Uh -huh. Al Poliak, the owner, asked me to take it over about three years ago. Nice. And this year we're doing three nights. We've got J-Mo and Mark Quinones from the Allman Brothers band, <laughs> double drumming. Uh -huh. We have Brett Bass on bass from my band. We yeah. have Craig Dreyer from my band on keys. Uh -huh. And then we have Matt Schofield. For nice. three nights, the two Man, of us on guitars doing Almond Brothers. That's records. gonna be killer. So, yeah. can can you get us um, a front row of course. seat so that we can heckle you? Of course, close up. Just bring some high no. E strings with you. You know, if that's not. It's not. <laughs> I will bring a whole box of them. That's not far from us, man. That's like about four hours, maybe four and a half. I hours. mean, I could. T I'm playing that in Jacksonville. Could be really, that's going to be down. an incredible, incredible show with yeah. a phenomenal audience. By the way, they're they're just going to love you guys there. They're oh yeah, I mean, last year we were out. we were pretty close to sold out for all three nights last year. I'd be surprised if you're not sold out this year. Yeah, I think New Year's might might be gone. You'd have to check. The other two nights I know still have tickets. Okay. I'm going I'm going to Well, I got you guys. I'm going to talk to you right after this yeah, show. Yeah. We'll hook that up. I would love to do that. Um, let's get another tune in and then you're going to answer some questions. And by the way, uh Sao Paulo uh just chimed in. South Bavaria chimed in. Tehran, Iran, Iran just chimed in. Really? Zurich, Switzerland, That's Illinois, incredible. Alabama. It's a what a beautiful family of guitar players That's and incredible. musicians around the world, right? Uh, it's unbelievable. Okay, do whipping post. I think we've heard that tune before. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you've only heard how it was originally composed if you've gotten either the Searching for Simplicity Greg yeah. Allman record yeah. or the Back to Making Live record that yeah. I was part of. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know. With Back to Making Live, which we did in 2011, we had been playing, since I joined the band in 2008, this version of Whipping Post, where uh -huh. Greg originally wrote it in 4-4. So if you know the Allman Brothers, everyone knows the Allman Brothers yes. version. But you have the opening lick. Yeah. That was Barry Oakley's. Uh -huh. You know, the... Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Greg didn't have anything to do with that. Uh-huh. 
And then the th whole thing of like having the verse in 6-8 was also the band's idea. Yeah. And they were playing it, I think Greg was actually playing it as a dominant seven with a major third. <laughs> On the organ. I've been lied to. You know that? Yeah. One, two, three, yeah. four, five, six. And sometimes I feel. That's 12-8 there, <laughs> right? And then the whole. It's all in 12-8, and yeah. then it goes back to 11, and then uh -huh. it goes to 6, and they uh -huh. sold in 6. Well, Greg wrote it, wrote the whole song as a minor funk tune. So the way he wrote it was, yeah. I've been run down. I've been lied to. And I don't know why I let that be woman play me out of fool. So that's how he wrote it. So basically, in our band, we played the whole song as 4-4. Uh -huh. And if you listen, there's something I didn't touch on in the course, but you'll hear on the version we did on the record, is yeah. I came up with the idea to reference the Allman Brothers before the guitar solo. Nice. So we stuck in that uh -huh. 11 thing uh -huh. in the middle of the song to set up the guitar solo. Mm. But the whole rest of it is in 4-4. So it just piles ahead like a funk tune with That's some breaks. Great. And what I demonstrate in this video is when... I got the gig, I had all these recordings, board tapes of the Greg Allman band, mm -hmm. and the version, there were a couple drafts right before I joined in 2008, and one of them had Robin Ford on guitar. Really? He did like a tour or a tour and a half with Greg, no Willie Weeks on bass, yeah. and Neil Larson was on keys MDing the whole thing, so all-star band, uh -huh. in, my, in my opinion. Absolutely. And uh, Warren, uh, you know, um, Robin had this part that I thought was really cool for the intro. So I copped a little bit of it and uh -huh. put a little of my own stuff in it. And then when I got to the verse, I didn't really know what to play uh -huh. because Greg was strumming away on an electric like, like I was just doing. And then the keyboard player was playing long tone chords on the organ on the high uh -huh. part of the organ. Yeah. So he was doing all the triads up yeah. there. Yeah. So I needed to find a sonic space to fit. And basically what I ended up doing is I kind of like nestled between our percussionist, Mark Quinones, and Steve Potts, the drummer, and just came up with like a one note thing that's kind of like a Nigerian funk or like a James <laughs> Brown, Jimmy uh -huh. Nolan type thing. Yeah. Just like three, four, one of these things like. Nice. I just picked like something like that. Like a little bubble part kind of thing, yeah. right? Nice. And it really, I, I think it, between that and the bass line, which, you know, when I joined the band in 2008, Jerry Jamat was the bass player. Yeah. No, no slouch there. No. Well, a legend. <laughs> you know, say. Jaco Pastor is his favorite bass player. <laughs> oh, God. But he had a bass line that was really cool. It was like, <laughs> it was just kind of like driving. So this, uh -huh. it fit. It fit just right sandwiched in right in between what everyone yeah, was doing. That's great, man. And that's part of what this course is about is like using your ears and your instincts and, and you know, being very sensitive to what's around you to complement the song. Yeah, you know. well, and that's a good point is you will definitely learn. There's, a, you know, just a ton of stuff that you'll pick up, lines, uh, comping approaches, but it's the gray matter that you share that kind of feeds that creative approach. That's the true gold in this particular course for any player, no matter what you do. Um, so but are you going to play the rhythm part and the lead part here now? Yeah, I can play the rhythm part first and just kind of show you how it fits against the groove. This yeah. is my band playing the same groove. Let's do it.
kind of a couple different cool. ideas of what yeah, to yeah. do over it. But that so, was the intro, too, that's that beautiful. I played. Yeah. Play the solo part now. Okay. So if we could start it, Tommy, a little bit like when that riff kicks in, please. can't lose with a minor you know oh man you just keep going and going um so but number one you, you've got to pick up scott's albums don't stream them buy are these available on vinyl we have a lot of vinyl you know i i'm i gotta be honest with you buddy i hate to burst your bubble yeah. but i'm done with physical you are done physical with is gone my friend oh come on what we I, have a big here's, vinyl here's what collection. i'm gonna encourage everybody to do i want saving grace on vinyl here's man. what i'm gonna do okay i'm gonna encourage everybody to subscribe yeah. to my channel okay good. here on true fire which awesome. i'm gonna launch later this month yeah and to get the courses here yeah and to support me as an educator so i can fund records nice that's what i'm gonna i'm gonna ask everybody to do and also to attend the concerts when we're able to do them awesome you know? so that's the best way to support a musical thank artist. you for bringing that up so you know the channels are our brand new platform we announced them officially in uh, august and september scott's putting one together that's going to be crazy okay uh, you subscribe to that channel, and I will personally guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. You've got some great ideas for that channel, and it's a terrific way to uh, connect with Scott and everything that he's doing. Um, there'll be exclusive video content on there. There'll be all he's he's crazy man. You can you can tell that right now. Very learned scholar <laughs> of the arts across all genres. And by the way, while I'm um, doing my gratuitous advertising thing. Um, you have that 25% promo code. I know our family of students very well, having lived with them now for over 20 years. Um, the, the Southern Roots, your first project, we got great feedback on. Rushed you back here to do these two, which are perfect companions to the first one. There are now three projects there's a 25% promo code. It's Scott Live. There's a link right under the video. You can go and order them right now. You got 48 hours. You save 25%. And, um, you know, you just, you need to support this artist because I really think you're, you know, leading the charge on where this whole thing is going, you know, and we love you. You did a great job here over two days. Um, and uh, I'm going to give the trivia question, give you guys one more chance to answer this question to win the $100 gift card. Scott just joined a very well-known band, one of my favorite bands, and in fact, one of Jimmy Page's favorite bands of all time. I don't, did you know that? Yeah, I, have, I actually have a picture of these two bands together okay. that my friend just sent me the Jimmy other day. Jimmy Page loved this band. How could me? you not? Uh, how could you not? And this band has seen the hint 
Bright Lights O' Memphis and the Commodore Hotel. Name that band, use the link underneath the video um, or in the chat thread, and in the next five minutes we'll pick a winner or in the next minute, but you know, do it now, but don't answer it in the thread. And listen, while you're over there underneath the video, click that thumbs up, show your love, share your love. And I see that Italy just chimed in from Florence, Italy, and from New Hampshire. Oh, Florence is um, amazing. I grew up in Florence. As a, as a baby, it was my first language. My, oh, my father studied art over there. No so. wonder your hope was romantic. <laughs> of course, man. That place will change your life. Oh, my God. Incredible. Um, okay, so let's answer a question. And then you got to tell everyone about the guitar, okay? The guitar that, <laughs> as always. As always, <laughs> you know? Um, but here, answer this question, if you would. Um, this is from, uh, um, from Paolo. Scott, you said that you're inspired by horn players in your phrasing. Can you elaborate further on this? How do you approach your solos? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really glad you've asked that question. Um, you know... We cover this a lot in Southern Roots mm -hmm. and in the two new videos. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost like, as far as improvisation, I'd say it's at least a third of what I cover mm -hmm. is how to sound like a horn player, mm -hmm. whether it's talking about Miles's scale approach or it's yeah. talking about Maceo's rhythm mm -hmm. or it's talking about King Curtis's, mm -hmm. you know, style of sustain and vibrato. So, I mean, really, the other thing I even covered is I, I was talking about this lick that I play in the 30 licks where... I'm trying to get it to sound like the pads on a uh, saxophone mm -hmm. as the air goes. You know how yes. when you listen to those records yes. of like Dexter Gordon and yeah. Coleman Hawkins uh -huh. and Lester Young, and you can yeah. hear them breathing into the horn and you hear the pads clicking, oh, yeah, it's like, like getting stuff like that, like, yeah. like trying to get stuff like that where yeah. it's got that sensitivity yeah. and that dynamic. Um, there's a million ways you can do it. And, when I was a kid growing up, you know, my parents listened to, my dad's a guitar player and singer, but they listened to a lot of R&B music. We were, they grew up in the Detroit area and around Michigan and Ann Arbor. And um, they were always really into Junior Walker and the All-Stars and, you know, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels and all those different bands that came out of there. And of course, out of that, there was just a ton of like James Brown and, um, you know, and ultimately in Aretha Franklin, and of course, the the horn solos on Aretha Franklin, the most iconic ones, those tenor solos are King Curtis. Oh, yeah. And I tried to learn those on guitar when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and then I was trying to learn those those sax breaks on James Brown on the guitar. I just, it was almost like I wanted to be a sax player, but my mm -hmm. house just had a few guitars in it, so I just <laughs> yeah. went with it because it's yeah. all I had. Yeah. But I really wanted to play the tenor sax or the B3 organ. Uh -huh. So often, and this is in both the series, or yes, all it, three of the series, yeah. is I often reference B3 organ players uh -huh. and horn players yeah. and how they've inspired me to come up with different approaches to playing the guitar. Yeah, you will, you will love these lessons. Um, I don't say this on every live, I really don't, Scott, but this is one of the courses that I ask uh, Tommy and Seth, you know, burn me a rough comp of the videos <laughs> before you take it to post so I can take a few of these things home. Um, I, I know you guys will love this. And Scott, thank you for carving out the time. Oh, you got to tell us about the guitar before we play out. All right. You know, well, they're, um, they're asking. You know, Gibson keeps changing hands, guys. Two years ago, they took this guitar in Memphis for two days. Uh -huh. They measured it. They were going to make me a signature model. Yeah. And then they closed the plant and fired everybody <laughs> who was doing it. So this is a public plea to anyone out there. Uh -huh. You know, I don't know. Who, whoever's running so Gibson the model, now. That model you've got the measurement on, somewhere. Yeah, I know. So, so this is a guitar they don't make anymore. That's Which why it's so important. Three. 336. 336. Custom yeah. shop, yeah. CS336, made mm -hmm. in Nashville somewhere mm -hmm. around 2001. Now, Harrington plays a 336, too, is it? He still or has one. He doesn't play yes, it Yes, he does play it, but he, he doesn't play it. I don't know of anybody who plays it as much as I do. Yeah, you're synonymous with this guitar, which is why Gibson should make this guitar. Well, they I were mean, going to. So. I mean, it's a fab. First of all, I don't know why they don't make that guitar anymore. It's smaller than the 335. It sounds beautiful. To me, it sounds better than a 335 for what I want because I want to cross between a Tele and yep. a 335. Exactly. And that's where this lives. Exactly. And now the other thing I'll tell you that everyone thinks it's a 339, and yeah. indeed they do make a 339. 
39. Yeah. There's two major problems. Well, there's a lot of major problems with the 339 versus this guitar. Yeah. One is the craftsmanship is just not there. Yeah. The inside of this guitar has a sound hole that they were calling, they were marketing it at the time in this mm -hmm. ad as tonally carved. Mm -hmm. And it's a shrunken L5 arch top sound hole in mm -hmm. here. It's got a very unique resonance. Really? And then the, the neck is a 59 slim neck. This yeah. is the most coveted, uh, like, vintage ES neck. Uh -huh. It's super slim, super easy to play. Yeah. And then I've replaced everything else. Yep. The pickups are made by Wiz, yeah. W-I-Z-Z. Mm -hmm. This guy is incredible. Uh -huh. I have compared these to real PA PAFs in really? 50s Les Pauls, yeah. and they sound, if, if not exactly the same, maybe better. Mm. So WIZZ pickups definitely hit up this cat. I put a master volume in the F hole. This was done by my tech for 20 years, Paul Schwartz at Pika Moose in New York City. Okay. And in fact, funnily enough, Paul put the locking tuners on this. Mm -hmm. He put his own frets on here. He put the master volume in the F hole. He replaced all the wiring with high grade speaker cable. He put the pickups in. He replaced the saddles with these Tusk style saddles. Mm -hmm. And he sets them a really interesting way that imitates a top wrap because mm -hmm. a lot of guys used to pull the string around the back and over the top and what he does is he sets these saddles to imitate the top wrap without out actually having to wrap nice. around the back um and i can tell you that i know for a fact that at least a couple people have bought a 336 after seeing me on ebay from and 2001 or him. two sent it to paul yeah. and said due to my guitar what you did to Sherrard's." So, so I've already uh, sold a few of these for Gibson. So I have a feeling <laughs> that this person sitting across from you is inclined to do the same. I bought a 336 after I saw Harrington play it with Steely Dan. Is that the one just, sitting over there? Because um, that's a different... Yeah. That's a yes. three. It, was that marketed as a 336 or is that like a 356 or something? I think it's 336. So okay. that must have been an early... Could that have been like 99 or 2000? I really don't even or have later. any idea. I don't know. But um, I would love to have your guitar right there. And so I would do exactly that. So give, tell us where can we get in touch with this guitar guy in New York City? I mean, this this guy, I, give him props. I can't What's say enough website, great things about him. Full name, talk. So don't Paul talk Schwartz. So New York fast. Yeah, okay? Paul Schwartz is his name. Yeah. Um, he's a New Yorker. Yeah. Um, by birth, and uh, he's in Harlem now, which is where I live, mm -hmm. which is incredible for me because yeah. he used to be in Midtown, so now right. I can literally walk to his shop. Nice. And um, you know, his company is called Peekamoose, like Peek the uh, ski, spell, like the ski slope. Spell that, would you? P e e k. Yeah. Uh, just a a by itself. Okay. Moose. M o o s e. Peekamoose. Okay. Cool. Peekamoose Guitars, New York City, and he takes stuff by FedEx all the time. I've had guys from all over the country FedEx him the guitar that they yeah. get on eBay. Yeah. And then they basically, he just tricks it out for him and does exactly, he did an extensive amount of work on this guitar. I mean, he basically designed this guitar with me. We basically designed the guitar together. So if we sent him a guitar and said, charadize it, yes. he'd do it, He right? would know what to do. Awesome, man. Uh, it is beautiful. It, and no holes sound. drilled. Yeah, you know? incredible. Jack Pearson used to play one of these did he a really? number of I years ago. There's some great videos of him playing these online. And he he told me when he saw mine, he was like, damn it, man. When I when I gave it to Gibson, I told him, don't drill a hole. And they kept drilling a hole telling uh -huh. me that, you know, because everything is about like copyright yeah. and, and trademark stuff. Yeah. And they wanted the whole F hole to be visible. Uh huh. But when Paul did it for me, I was like, so you're going to drill a hole? He's like, no, we're not going to drill a hole. I'll just get a washer and I'll stick the master volume in the top of the F hole. He's like, go. why do you want to put a hole in your guitar? Exactly. But they didn't exactly. want to do that for Jack. So yeah. when he saw mine, he's like, how'd you get that done? I said, exactly. I have this guy. Yeah, you know? easy. I had the right guy do it, right? But and apparently it scarred Jack so much. Now he plays a $300 guitar. <laughs> he plays a squire now. I, so. I know he does. And it sounds... Phenomenal. It's all in the hands, bro. It doesn't it matter. Is, it is. It's it's not the arrow. It's the uh, Indian. I know. You're right. Okay. Listen, man. Thank you so much for doing this. I know you have a little work to do on the on the trailers for the new courses. But would you please play us out with my true friend? Sure. Yeah. Set, set it up for us. Uh, yet another song I wrote with Greg Allman. This one was actually the lead track off of uh, our last record we recorded together, Southern Blood, and uh, we were nominated for. Uh, two Grammys for the record. One was for the album itself and the other was for this song uh, mm -hmm. as Americana Song of the Year. So nice. I was really proud of writing this song with him and um, 
you know, the fact that even after his after his passing, we managed to pull off a Grammy nomination was pretty awesome. Right. So, uh, so we talk about this song quite a bit in the series, and you know, the the writing of it, and the the um, specifically about the two improvisations I have in it. There's one in the middle, and there's the one at the end. And I tell the story, and I'll do the brief version of it now, mm -hmm. where when I was walking into the the studio to overdub this guitar solo. Greg gave me a direction, which he very rarely gave me directions, but this was one of them, as he said, can you do something that's like David Gilmore and Kenny Burrell together? Really? Yeah. Wow. Not a bad job working with Greg. No. That's like your dream combination to get asked. Yeah. So what I played was I tried to play something that, that had the sparseness and the vocal quality that David is so, so brilliant with, mm -hmm. and then also get some of the, the modality, the, the modal jazz language uh, that that you would associate with some of Kenny's output from the late 50s and early 60s. So yeah, I don't know. Right. I oh, tried my best. Before you start, um, uh, give them the answer. Who You just joined a one of my favorite bands of all time. Who did you just join? And mine, too, I should yeah, know. I know. Uh, Little Feet. There you go, man. Viva Incredible. Paul Barrer, man. We, oh. we lost him. I, I was subbing for him, and we lost him on my first gig, and... I mean, obviously, for the for the guys in the band, it was just it was so hard to watch them go through that. But it just we just played these shows and they were just pure magic. And um, I, I got to say, man, they sound incredible. Um, and uh, it was really inspiring. We're going to Jamaica for a week. There's still some tickets for that mm -hmm. with my other favorite band of all time, Los Lobos mm. oh, and the Midnight Ramble Band, who are uh -huh. old friends of mine because, I, you know, I've, uh -huh. I've known those guys for years through, yeah. you know, playing at Levon Helms Barn yeah. and sitting in with his band and yeah. recording records there. So nice. it's going to be a big family affair in Jamaica in January, which you can't lose with that. Um, and then from there, we'll see where it goes. There's a lot of interesting talk about doing a lot more shows and maybe even a recording i don't know we'll see what all happens well, but good they are my them. favorite band of all time good, good if i had to pick one them. i know it's just a beautiful thing i was so excited to hear that man me too good luck with that and I, i'm happy to report that they're the nicest people and just I, I, completely I, amazing I know, you know like you know they there's a saying don't meet your heroes you know I am happy to report that i've met so many of my guitar heroes here at true fire and Never disappointed. Never. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, know? humility is the uh, key ingredient in anything in life, but especially in a craft like music. Oh, yeah. You know, if you lose the humility and you lose the ability to be a fan and someone who appreciates and feels like part of a community, uh, you're going to lose all the power be behind every note you play, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it, the further illustrated and demonstrated every time we do one of these True Fire Live things, crosses borders, time zones, continents, you know, races, creeds, colors. It's a real community. Yeah. You know? um, anyway, play us out, man. Let's do My True Friend. All right. Okay. <laughs> 